book of Acts and it gives a place for two years. Well, there's one place at least that I uh, included the scripture, but somehow another when I printed them off, they weren't there. It's three verses. But uh, our lesson this evening, and when you turn to the book of Acts, about the first four chapters is what we're going to be referencing. Well, we're going to talk this, this evening about the greatness of the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. It was the first church that was there, the first church ever anywhere. And, and we know they taught the Baptist doctrine. They Amen. weren't called the Baptists in those days, but we're going to go ahead and name them that, the name that they took on later on. And it wasn't from John the Baptist. Uh, John was the Baptist, wasn't he? wasn't a Baptist, he was the Baptist at the time. He came baptized. And the first church, of course, was at Jerusalem. So uh, we are right in that respect. But everything necessary to make a church great can be found in the Jerusalem church. Uh, from this standpoint, we do well to imitate some of the things they did, and that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. What made them great, and what still works. But in Acts chapter 1, let's begin reading with verse 12 through verse 14. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem is a Sabbath day's journey. Not very far, I'll tell you that. When they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter, James, and Andrew, uh, uh, and John, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew. This James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James. So they had a pretty good crowd, didn't they? These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, his fleshly brothers were there. But there was a great uh, gathering together, and God people still need to do that today, don't they? can't harp at y'all about uh, being a church because people come on Wednesday night they're faithful anyway. It's those others that you see they used to call them morning glories. You see them sometime on Sunday morning that'd be it. Yeah. But if you would let's look at Acts 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all of one accord in one place. Now, there, had, there was a great gathering, wasn't it? This indeed was a great gathering. And they were all together in the same place. And in order to be a part of a church, uh, the church means you call out assembly, you got to be there. Because <laughs> that's what it means to call out group. If you're not there, you're not representing yourself or the Lord. All right, but we find a, another gathering like this in the days of Nehemiah. And if you would, let's look at Nehemiah 8 and verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. Wouldn't that be great if that was still true, wouldn't it? They listened to what God had to say in His Word. The good part about it, what was true then is still true now. God's Word hadn't changed. 
these people were attentive to it. Now, those in the Jerusalem church knew why they gathered together. They loved the Lord. They loved what He did for them. And likewise, the reason we're here. But when they gathered, the Lord met with them. And if you would look at Acts first, chapter 1, verse 4, middle of your page. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, Ye have heard of me. The command that together is still in effect. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some men, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see it the day approaching. You'll read that next verse as far as if we sin willfully. After that we've come to the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for that sin. And it's talking about the forsaking of the assembly of ourselves. I mean, a blessing you can kiss goodbye because it's not coming back. You might get another day to worship, but the one you opportunity you had passed, it's gone. But they were in unity. They were all in one accord. And by the way, that's not advertising for Honda. <laughs> Take a pretty big car to get 120 in, wouldn't it? They said they were all in one accord. <laughs> it could have been a Honda, could it? But that was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in uh, Acts 2, verse 4, if you would, look at your paper. Acts 2, <laughs> verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you would look at Acts 2, verse 8 in your Bible, give you a chance to. Acts 2, verse 8. When they were speaking in other tongues, this, is, this was a response. They said, And how hear we every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born. How do these guys know our language? Now, folks, this wasn't some kind of jibber-jabber. The, the Pentecost would do it today, they, and I showed Linda a, a video somebody put on YouTube, on Facebook. You haven't seen that, Brother Ricky? A little Pentecost for women uh, bouncing all over the floor, no. picking a head and going like, <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't believe it. They were rolling all over the place. And supposedly speaking in tongues, and that's what Paul said. If this is going to cause trouble, let you women keep silent in the church. And it was all women that were doing it. Hmm. And they weren't some kind of jibber jabber or some kind of unknown stuff that people said, hey, this guy is talking in our tongue. And if you go back and count them, when the Lord gives the nations that were gathered, there were 17. 17 different languages being spoken. Well, it was unknown to some because when a real guy comes in, even with a, uh, with my limited, I can't understand it. Uh, they come in with a foreign language. Uh, Giselle, I have a little problem communicating with her because she doesn't speak good English, does she? She's trying. But this, this wasn't some kind of unintelligible language they were using. But the Pentecostal would have you think so otherwise. But they were all in one accord. And Acts 2 verse 8 tells us uh, that they heard in their own language. But we asked the question then that when the Spirit came, why did the Spirit come? And if we, the answer is Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall see power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, 
both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So the Lord came to give us power and to be a witness unto Him. And if you were looking at the next verse there, Luke 24, verse 49. The Lord talked and said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. The Lord kept that promise. He sent the Holy Spirit and empowered the church. And the Holy Spirit has been here ever since. Now, there was great preaching when all this occurred. If you would look at Acts 2, verse 14. With Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken to my words. And if you would read that next verse, Acts 2, verse 36, just verse 36. As he continued with his message, he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Hey, you, you crucified our Savior. He was pointing out to the Jews, didn't he? The preaching was very simple. They Preach the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Nothing complicated about it. Amen. Simple as a child could understand it. And the preaching was very pointed. And if you look at Acts 2, verse 21, as you come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If they hold out. No. With what God said. Man to come along and edit that part, hadn't he? If he holds out. But as a result of the preaching, there was a great conviction among those that heard it. If you would look back at your paper there, verse 37, at the top of your page, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were totally under conviction of the Spirit. And they said, Lord, what shall we do? And of course, they responded what they should do, didn't they? There was a great baptizing resulted from that. Acts 2, verse 41. You would. Then they that had to receive the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now this was the infant church. All right. It get started, but the Lord blessed. The Lord is still blessed. <coughs> if people will listen to the word, and accept the word. But there came a time of great rejoicing. If you would look at Acts 2, verse 46 and 47. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the Lord added, didn't he? And then the part that I had put on our paper, but somehow or another it got erased before I got it to the printer. 
I didn't notice it until I was doing a review over it later on. If you would turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Acts 4, verse 31 to verse 33. Just three verses. Acts 4, verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. They were not ashamed. They were not afraid. But the Lord gave them the uh, strength. And they proclaimed the word mightily. <clears throat> Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, one soul. And never, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things coming. What yours is mine, right? Now, the communists tried to accuse the Christian church of being communist because of this statement. And not so. Verse 33 said, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Oh, we still need that grace today, don't we? Yes. We still need to pray as they did. Yes. But there was a little difference, a great difference among them. They had a problem, and every time you got together, uh, the church is made up of flesh and blood. The carnal is going to show up sometimes. And it did here. And y'all know the story of Ananias and Sapphire. But let's read just briefly two verses. Acts 6, verse 1 and 2. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, the church really began to grow, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. We've got to give ourselves to the Word of God, right? And that's where deacons came in, wasn't it? Take the burden off of the pastors where they could give themselves to the Word and proclaim it. By the way, in the news this, this week, uh, they had a write-up in the Chronicle some woman in a United Methodist Church, they've set aside as a deacon, they're going to ordain her later on this year. Who is a, I call her a transvestite, <laughs> transgender. Be the first transgender person, but she had a, uh, been living as a married lesbian. But now, so y'all will know, a deacon in the Methodist Church is much higher even than a pastor, because they ordain pastors as deacons. I don't know how, where they get that at, but, but that's what they do. But they were going to ordain this woman. They set her aside as a uh, transgender to ordain her as a deacon. That means a leader of the church. She gets to appoint pastors for, uh, that she thinks they ought to be. Can you imagine that? Not according to the word of the Lord, is it? That's part of the day we're living in. Okay. Um, so they had problems. Problems cropped up. And when a church grows, because we're all human, we have our own deficiencies. And sometimes a carnal man wants to take over. And it's created problems uh, for ages. And that we come to that scripture where it said let your women keep silence that was a special case Paul was saying hey a problem going on in that case if your women going to cause a problem keep them quiet and that was the situation and, that, and they followed suit they did as instructed uh, 
But they overcame their problems. If you will, look at Acts chapter 5 back on your paper. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphire's wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. The wife also being pried to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that was a mistake, wasn't it? They lied about what uh, they gave to the Lord. Well, you know, some things you might get by lying about. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be lying about your business between you and God. You're not lying to anybody but yourself because God knows the truth, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. And uh, it brought their end. And remember what the scripture said people, after that happened, they were afraid to join the church because they didn't want the same thing happen. Uh, but people need a respect for the church. We'll come back to the question as we conclude. What was the basis of their greatness? Something made them great. Number one, they loved Jesus. Who He is and what He's done. And they loved each other. And folks, you're going to love each other. It means you're going to love imperfect people because none of us in here are perfect. And uh, they were great because they had a story to tell. And they were willing to give their lives for the gospel that other people might be saved. But we still got folk here that's willing to do that. And these people here especially, they were witness to our Lord's uh, work and they wanted to see him again and we want to see him for the first time don't we but what was the result of all this well the, the scripture teaches us the lost were saved the church was built up enemies were conquered and the world was blessed by their existence One thing the church didn't have, and that was a fine building. They met wherever they could in the early days, and they were victimized. People didn't like Christianity, did they? By the way, y'all see in the news today that so-called killer that had killed his some of his family that Muslim guy y'all see where they gave him the death penalty did they had day paper he killed was it his sister from there and a Christian his daughter 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 was his daughter and her husband killed her and uh, there were about three that he actually killed I understand but because of Christianity, where do you reckon that come from? Satan, that's exactly what it is. You call it uh, Allah or whatever they call it. Think about old uh, Red Skelton. Every time I get on the thoughts there, he got a little movie out, a little place where he showed up up in Canada and uh, you know I, I, he's a funny guy but he said they asked him one day up there said uh, Mr. Kelton said what do you think about Buddha Buddha you know how he did about Buddha he scratched his head and said Buddha's okay but said Marjorie just too good <laughs> Some people all on their false gods. Okay. Y'all think it'll work? What worked in Jerusalem? I think it will. If you get people on fire for the Lord, and what that fire can start with us? Just don't get to jumping over these pews like <laughs> hole <holder> rollers. <laughs> well, when old Elijah faced.
to the prophets of Baal, and those prophets of Baal, they, they leaped all over the altar, didn't they? They cut their wrists and everything. An old uh, nice had a time with it. You know, get a little bit louder. You're not quite loud enough. Turn up the volume. Amen. <laughs> used to battle with the Pentecostal people. We had quite a few where I lived and worked, and one of my cousins was one of the preachers. Still is. He taught you had to live perfect after you got saved. I said, Glenn, you know better than that. But his teaching was that. And one day, while he was preaching on Sunday morning, he lost it. He picked up the pulpit stand like this and threw it at the congregation. Literally threw it. They call a deputy sheriff out there and put the those jackets that, that they call those. They put mental cases in. Uh, had him bound up and put him in the padded cell up at Lufkin up there. Uh, and he stayed there for several weeks. And folk, if I believed I had to live perfect, you could just about put me up there also. Because no man's going to be perfect in this flesh. I don't care who we are. I believe every Christian wants to be perfect. I believe that's the desire of all of us is to please the Lord that much. But we don't attain that. That's why Paul said, I press toward the mark of the pride of the high calling. Meekness and lowliness is the evidence of that. Yeah. And people who get haughty because they got the spirit or whatever, yeah. they're not meek and lowly. And that's the only thing that keeps us from being a bunch of jackasses ourselves. Yeah. Is that, that the Lord keeps us meek and lowly. You just don't bring me a rattlesnake. <laughs> We've had some videos of some of those snake services. We haven't had one lately, but we had videos showing about 30 minutes of clips of that. What people do in the name of religion. And I tell you what, folks, if, if, if uh, I find out they're going to have one there, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> I'm not going to look up a rattlesnake. But you can take a rattlesnake and you can put him in a slimy pit. He's a snake there, but you can take him and put him on display in the uh, nicest surroundings you can find, but he's still a poisonous venom snake. And that's the way about the teaching, folks, uh, the false teaching that they spread out there, and it has been. They don't realize when they're teaching somebody that how good they live is going to wind them up in hell. And they're going to be the cause, the false teacher is going to be the cause of that person going there. And that's why a person needs to stay in this Word, read the Word, and, and apply it to their life so they'll know. Amen. Don't take the Word of some uh, false prophet. Because they're there. The Lord warned us way ahead of time. If you don't believe that, just cut on your TV a moment. Especially Sunday morning, you'll find something. 